So chat, we're really pleased to welcome Sarah Ticho, who is the CEO of Hatsumi VR. I met Sarah at the TechShare Pro conference in December last year. Sarah's doing some really interesting stuff. I sat through um, Sarah's presentation. Normally when I'm up for speaking, I'm not really, and I'm next up, I'm not really listening to anyone, but she completely captured my imagination with the work that she's doing. And I'm really you know, delighted that we could have you on as a guest today. So Sarah, uh, welcome. It's it's really a pleasure to have you on. Can you tell us a bit about who you are and, and, and what you're doing? Oh, cool. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yeah, so my name is Sarah Tico. I'm the founder of Hatsumi VR. Uh, so Hatsumi means to see something for the, for the first time. And, uh, and what we're doing is developing a behavioral healthcare platform that enables people to visualize different forms of lived experience, such as chronic pain and mental health conditions, using 3D painting tools. Um, and so my interest in this first came from my own lived experience of psychosis, actually, a few years back. Um, and I had a one-time episode uh, whilst I was away on holiday, in fact, alone. And uh, it was sort of coming back to the UK and being going through this sort of process of being diagnosed with a, a mental health condition and feeling like you weren't being heard. And, and I was really interested in this idea of, you know, things that you can't really show people and that go unseen. Um, and so uh, I ended up uh, a few years later working at a mental health and arts festival in Australia as a virtual reality uh, curator and became really interested in using VR as a tool that can uh, be used therapeutically and help people overcome mental health problems, but also as this really sort of powerful storytelling tool as well, and has the opportunity to, you know, uh, enable you to be an artist in that experience. Um, so I came across uh, an arts and health research method called body mapping that uh, traditionally you draw around your entire body on a piece of paper, and you're encouraged to go through a mindfulness experience and think, you know, what does my anxiety look like in my body and where do you physically feel that experience or what does chronic pain look like and sort of uh, illustrate that and using different colors and textures so um so what we're doing is we're translating that into a virtual environment and sort of adding a new sort of digital layer to it so um so there's a three-dimensional body and then using a series of painting tools that we've created you can illustrate that experience um, we're still in development at the moment um, but the next stage is that we want to build an online archive so that you can um, uh, you can have your own personal journal, but also uh, be able to upload it to an online archive anonymously and explore other people's and have insight into uh, the lived experience of others as well. We can't hear you, Neil. Ah, Deborah, I was, I was saying was that you'd be itching to get in here because I know you're going to have loads of loads of uh, comments around this. I I I I told you it was going to be super interesting. Uh, I, I we've we've touched on pain before. We've touched on mental health before. We've touched on VR. This is the meeting point for them all. So um, <laughs> over to you. Yeah, it, and you're right. Wow, wow, Sarah, that is. That, that's really amazing. And before we started, I had mentioned to you that um, I have a daughter, she's 31 years old with Down syndrome. And she, um, <clears throat> when we had, we had Kate on in the past talking about chronic, um, chronic pain. And at the time, you know, my father had experienced chronic pain, my, my siblings, blah, blah. But I didn't realize that my daughter was actually experiencing chronic pain right then. And I did not even realize it. And she, it wound up going through a real health crisis and but she and i don't think i told her this sarah but along the way she decided and if i did tell her this it was an accident but she decided that good girls on happy international women's day but good girls don't tell you that they're in pain they just suck it up and deal with it and also <clears throat> we all handle pain differently and my daughter having down syndrome she's blessed in that she can tolerate pain much better than say i can but at the same time it's sort of a curse because pain is an indicator something's wrong we need to address it but sarah she's also an artist so i'm so fascinated with this topic and i will have to be careful about not going on and on or they'll antonio and neil will have to mute me but 
I think this is so beautiful because I would be curious to see my daughter do something like this because she uses her brain differently because you know of who she is and we have worked so hard at trying to teach her to tell us what's happening so that we can respond to it and <clears throat> when she was in the hospital at Henrico Doctors Hospital which we love the nurses and I we all started getting much better at reading her body language to determine when there was a problem and so I'm fascinated about what you're doing and and how we would use this to express what the pain is for us so I'm totally fascinated with the work so I was just wondering if you could just delve in a little bit more to that because we all we all internalize pain differently. We all express it differently. Society will come and say, oh, well, Sarah, you're not good enough because you have this. So there's, like you said, it's so nuanced. Mm, absolutely. And uh, and I think that's one of the areas I get really excited about with, you know, the potential applications of this is uh, kind of giving a voice to people that perhaps don't have voices and are nonverbal or you know, young people as well that find things difficult to communicate anyway. Um, but I think we all do, right? Sometimes, especially when it comes to emotions. And um, and it was kind of during this research that I came across this uh, kind of research tool, or not research tool, sorry, that back, a uh, form of uh, a sense that we don't really explore very often called interoception, which is this sort of the internal state that we live with every day. Um, and you know hunger and emotion and temperature and I think we're always so outward facing that I'm really interested in yeah different tools that can make us sort of reflect on our own internal experience as well um, but I think there's so many sort of different implications on how we or different ways of exploring the variety of experience as well and um, especially how cultural influence can change the way that we experience pain as well um, before I start, well, around the time that I first uh, started to uh, create this with a whole team of people as well that have, have really helped along with the process as well. Um, but I was a researcher at Stanford University on a project called Spiritual Curiosity in the Mind. Um, and it was a cross-cultural research study looking at the sensory experience of communicating with God and how that differs cross-culturally. And I've been really interested like how to how to bring some of those learnings from that research study into this and thinking about the different ways that people experience uh, pain and emotion around the world as well um, and uh, you know colors have different uh, resonances with people here red is seen as very passionate and, and perhaps dangerous in the west but then in the east then you know it's uh, it's associated with luck and all the temples are, are red in Japan and um, so as part of this archive that we're developing, what I would love to do one day is to be able to do um, uh, some analysis on the different ways that people uh, express different types of lived experience. Wow. You know, Sarah, as, as you're talking about all this, I one thing that we talk a lot about on Access Chat, and I talk it about, about it on my other show, Human Potential at Work, which I definitely want you to be on that show, but... <laughs> We, we're still trying to figure out what it means to truly be fully human. So, for example, there's some things happening in Scandinavian countries in Australia. Australia recently passed a law or some legislation that um, allows their citizens to um, abort your baby at any time during the pregnancy, I, you know, um, if they have Down syndrome. And so I absolutely am not interested in getting a discussion about abortion or pro-life or pro-choice. I believe that the government shouldn't be telling women what to do with their bodies, for example. But at the same time, having a family member with Down syndrome that has touched my life so much, I want to at least, you know, join the conversation that says before we decide people with Down syndrome don't even deserve to be born. Um, do we even know what it means to truly be human? And that's why your work really, really fascinates me. And what could we learn from applying this and learning from it? And then you tied in God and spirituality to it. Uh, this is just really rich, 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 important work. And I, I'm going on and on. So I'm going to give the microphone to, um, I'll give it to you. And then Antonio Neal, I don't know who wants to go next. But Sarah, let me give it back to you. And. Um... 
yeah i mean there's there's so many different yeah opportunities for for inquiry of this but yeah i think the the nuances of of lived experience be it sort of yeah mental health conditions or you know yeah there's so many different ways that we can learn people and i think that there's such a frustration now with the way that people try to quantify who you are and what your condition is um, and especially, you know, well, with all sorts of things, with pain and depression, you know, on a scale of one to five, how much do you feel suicidal or, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how much, uh, how much, how intense is your pain? And so I'm really interested in how you can use qualitative tools like drawing and being able to uh, kind of supply people with these different textures and drawing tools that they can illustrate that and kind of be able to find some of these uh, perhaps commonalities that we have with people as well as our differences. Good. So uh, I, I'm particularly interested in the the, con the concept of pain within culture. So uh, different cultures can think of the pain, you know, completely different, you know, what is in... So, and at the same time, you know, especially amongst doctors, doctors and practitioners, things like, like chronic pain, are usually misunderstood, and sometimes doctors, especially when it concerns to women, they say, "Oh, uh, they don't seem to understand it," uh, or sometimes I say they're not even qualified to understand uh, things like chronic, uh, like uh, chronic pain. So, you no, know, I'm sure what I just expressed also gives the idea how complex and difficult this is. Okay. But how can you make sure that the person that is suffering can actually get the attention that she deserves uh, regarding all the rest? Um, I think it's important. Well, I'm, I'm not an authority on pain at all. I think this is just something that I've been really interested in exploring and speaking to other pain experts. But I think the real need that I seem to hear from people is that we need to have a, a holistic understanding of what contributes towards pain and that there are so many different contributors to it and there's you know previous injuries or um, disabilities that people have but I think things like loneliness and social isolation can play a really big role in it as well and uh, I'm really so excited for this sort of new wave of social prescribing that's um, occurring at the moment where you know people can go to doctors with chronic pain and mental health issues and and you know it's clear that there's there's more to it than just the sort of biological element of it it's the social elements as well and being able to refer somebody to a social prescriber that can say well, what's going on in your life you know are you embedded in the community um, oh, you used to love singing. Did you know that there's a choir around the corner? Or and actually looking at how, yeah, social activities and the arts can actually play a role in supporting people with pain and other issues as well. Neil, Neil, I'm sure you're saying something super brilliant right oh, now. Oh yeah, no, it's the it's the way that the system <laughs> double mute. So I, 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 I'm conscious that I've got the tabletop microphone and, and there's noise all around. So I muted on both the microphone and the, the program. Well done, Neil. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in all of the, the, the cultural stuff for, for sure, but also from the, the recent, like really recent lunchtime experience. So I went to the physio at lunchtime and they were doing the whole piece around sort of, you know, does this hurt and, and 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 so on and so forth and it had taken ages because I'd, I'd had a phone referral so they'd had someone sort of asking me a bunch of questions beforehand before booking the appointment and all this kind of stuff and I was just thinking you know with something like your your uh, virtual reality experience I could be providing that information remotely you know you could you could do that whole you know phone diagnosis much more accurately you know, I could be, you know, showing them that it's hurting at, at this point. You know, I could have the virtual body. I could be pointing to the bits, rather rather than you know them trying to do it over the phone. I think it's it's it, it's interesting, and I, I and I to totally take on board what you were saying about also ignoring pain and and attitudes to pain as well. So 
and 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 I'm very interested in diff different types of pain being um, how how you deal with them. So pain that you've not experienced before is much harder to deal with than pain that you're used to. So um, I'm I'm used to back pain. So I've had I've had back pain all my life. So I'm kind of just it's low level. You 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 become used to it and you set a level for that. Yeah. Um, but I, so I kind of just let things get to a really bad point <laughs> before I do anything about it. So I'm just wondering how tools like the ones you're developing might might actually sort of make it. And partly because of the friction of the health system, right? Because actually, it's really hard to get an appointment at the doctor's. You know, um, we're all really busy and, and, and they want you to go in the middle of your working day when you're um, actually you've got a lot of pressure to do work type stuff. And I know we have flexible working and I, I did eventually drag myself away from my desk and, and, and get some treatment. But I should have done it for earlier. But the way that the, the, the healthcare system is at the moment is that it's oh well we'll do this within working hours well <laughs> that's not very good for for working people i know there's a shift i know we've got things like doctor at hand coming where you you have a sort of skype appointment and, and you know we can get that now but how do you see vr be playing a role in 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 remote healthcare in the future yeah are you, are you yes yeah, let, let me interject that way because I can give, for example, uh, uh, to your point. My wife, she had, to, uh, uh, she had a car accident in the end of last year. So she had to go to physiotherapy. Yeah. Okay. And that, at, it was something that was booked during, the, uh, where, while she was at the end of the day, at hours that was, she was still supposed to be at work. Okay. And there was not really an option for her to go there at the time of the day where she was more relaxed or even weekends so she, when she was there she was not really just the fact okay i'm i'm leaving my work behind i'm going there she was not really no and then after that i need to go and pick up my daughter from school so it was not actually happening in at in the period where she was fully available to engage with with the, with the therapy Yeah, and I think, you know, virtual reality and technology is not always the answer. And I don't think you'll ever be able to replace, you know, a real interaction with people. But I think, yeah, accessibility on so many different levels is such a, a big issue, isn't it? And yeah, just being able to be physically present, get there on time and, you know, fit it into what's already a very busy day for most people. Um, yeah, the economics as well, just like the costs often stops people getting there. Mobility and um, psychological barriers as well. I think there's real, um, you know, it's a big step for some people to go and ask for help, um, especially with pain and mental health problems. And that's why I think technology has this real opportunity. And I think there's often less stigma associated with it as well. Uh, the rise of serious games and creating sort of video games to help people with mental health problems, I think, is is really exciting um, as you know something that also engages people and makes them want to um, explore their conditions and help um, overcome it a little bit more um, but yeah well, I'm really interested in in working with GPs and uh, people with lived experience to be able to design this a little bit better and, uh, and one of the things that we want to include is um, kind of to what you were saying Neil about you know wanting to uh, speak to your doctor and uh, and for them to be and to be able to show them that, but also be able to back it up with uh, perhaps that quantitative element as well. So we're building in sort of interactive surveys, so you you can do the whole you know this is this is my pain scale, and so you're able to see how you're feeling before, um, create your illustration, and then also see if uh, just the act of drawing is able to actually reduce some of that pain. Um, and I think yeah, the arts and health. Uh, you know the well, the arts in health helping with health outcomes and especially in art making can be really helpful in uh, reducing stress and anxiety. Um, and one thing we also want to do as well is um, is see if if it can actually have a meaningful impact on people's experience of pain. 
Uh, it's already a lot of research has been done into using virtual reality as a pain management tool in itself, so a form of distraction therapy. Um, there's an incredible woman up in Scotland called Kay Smith who uh, has a, a series of really awful illnesses, which means that she needs surgery quite regularly, but also cannot take any form of anaesthetic. And so she is curating virtual reality experiences um, and putting them into a playlist so it's long enough that she will actually wear it in uh, the surgery. And uh, it's also been used in, in birth as well, um, child labour. Uh, but what we want to do is, is the opposite. You know, this isn't about distraction. This is about sitting down with your experience and almost having a cup of tea with it and really prodding it and thinking about what's there. So, you know, the first stage is really sort of thinking, how how is this located? Where is this located in my body? What does it look like? Is it green or purple? Does it look like fire or electricity or smoke? Um, and what we want to build in afterwards is the ability for you to actually augment those illustrations as well. And so say you have created this illustration of pain and you can show it to your GP, you could show it to your best friend or your partner and say, this is what it's like and use it as a catalyst for conversation. Uh, but also see if, you know, through changing what that actually looks like, maybe even finding ways of shrinking it, especially through changing your own physiological response so using mindfulness and biofeedback tools then actually you know through deep breathing or you know different movements then shrinking it then we want to uh, eventually put it through trials to see if that is able to actually change your relationship with pain over time wow, um, wow. that that's incredible I, I have a few other nuances to ask you so back to, to my daughter's experience, she was in the hospital, she was in great pain. Um, and so the nurses would come or, the te, you know, the staff would come in to ask her, what is your pain from one to 10? Well, the, she, there's no way that my daughter can do that. And besides that, my one to 10 is going to be different from Antonio's one to 10 and your one to 10. And, and so we had created, we went and we got a real colorful uh, graphic that showed, you know, it, it had color and it had the facial expressions to try to help her understand how to tell us how much pain she was in. And, um, but, but also speaking of nuances, what was happening with her, um, because um, she had a blood clot in her, um, the vein going to her liver, she, the pain was radiating in different places. So she was getting like really bad pain um, under her, uh, right under her shoulder blades. And so the pain was radiating and it was uh, her body. So, you know, maybe she was having pain in her shoulder or in her upper back, but really where the problem was, was, was in the liver. So it, it's fascinating when we try to even express where our pain is. So, I mean, we can, Neil probably didn't even realize it, but before earlier on the show, he was rubbing his shoulder. So I knew his shoulder might be in pain, right? So I I think that's fascinating. As you have already mentioned, Sarah, if when we can't communicate it, the pain for a variety of reasons, maybe because we we don't speak like my chief accessibility officer, Rosemary, she cannot verbalize in the same way that we do. Um, or my daughter who can't intellectually tell us in the same way, or it's radiating different places. I, I mean, the nuances of this are fascinating. Yeah, and that's where it's important to um, kind of create different layers of opportunity for people to communicate that. Um, and that's why what, uh, once we get some funding, then we want to work with people uh, with different forms of lived experience on the co-design of those drawing tools and really find out what the nuances are of different types of pain and almost build up different palettes. Um, but then also uh, create opportunities for people to create audio descriptions that they, they can layer onto it as well, perhaps like words and text um, and, uh, and create spaces where perhaps it could even be social that you can actually physically bring somebody else into that space and show them it and then because I think the what was really unintended or an unexpected outcome of this is how how willing people are to talk about those experiences afterwards but the ability to focus on something else that's not you but still talk about you the way that you know when you sit next to somebody in a car and you just have those 
like wonderful conversations driving on the road just having something else to focus on can be really helpful as well so um but yeah i think being able to capture yeah different types of pain i'm really interested in and like you say the radiation or you know sharp pain and dull pain and uh and that can only ever really be explained or described by obviously people that have that experience as well which is why involving people in the co-design is so important um, as well as clinicians and you know other sort of healthcare providers and making sure that we're making something that's meaningful and helpful for everybody involved in the process you mentioned something something very important in terms of uh, uh, on, on terms of co-design can you tell us uh, elaborate a little bit more on that and how you make that a reality so we are so early stage at the moment we've completely bootstrapped everything that we've done so far um and it's just been people helping me part-time so we've we've uh, exhibited it in a few different exhibitions where so far i've just been crowdsourcing requests from people uh but what i'm doing at the moment is uh, building some partnerships with the nhs where we're going to be working with some chronic pain user groups and just going back to plain old pen and paper and paints and pens and chalks and we're going to run some workshops uh facilitated by an artist uh with lived experience of pain that does a lot of work already about visualizing her experience and so we're going to do um yeah that, like analog body mapping essentially and start to begin these conversations with people and then from that take that data which is just a, a you know a wonderful series of paintings and then start to build rebuild the drawing tools with that um, and so it's really important to involve artists on the development side as well and make sure that the drawing tools that we're creating are as powerful as what the uh, people with lived experience are illustrating because that was my frustration with trying uh, body mapping for the first time was that I was trying to get out something you know that is is your life you know and then i think there's often a barrier um to the arts for people or being artists because they don't feel that they can convey the power of, of their experience and i think that's what really drew me to vr there's a, an experience called tilt brush that's made by google and you get to float through space and paint with rainbows and you know smoke and glowing lights and there's something so empowering about that and uh, and so I hope that once we create the full version of this, that it will have the uh, sort of emotional resonance that that still has for me. Well, I think sometimes it's about letting people to go back when they were child, when they were kids, because sometimes people have so many uh, have so many worries in their life that when they are creating, when they are designing, when they are drawing, uh, they are not really able to express themselves in in a in a free way. So uh, it's it's very important to find a space where people can find really a, an opportunity where they can somehow be creative as a, as a you know in a sense uh, as a child approaches to drawing something absolutely i mean playfulness is so important in daily life and mental well-being and it's always the thing that gets put aside and i think that sadly sometimes we lose as we grow older but I think VR just it makes me feel like a child again and I kind of love that and just that kind of innate curiosity and I think it's such a an exciting space because it is so interdisciplinary and it's all used in you know uh very specific healthcare settings but yeah there's so much in my storytelling and opportunities as well um but also there's a long way to go I think especially with accessibility um accessibility and in inclusion it's really important um to think about you know how people are able to use this like controllers uh can blind people use vr and there is more research around um around that as well so uh yeah long way to go long way to go but but what an amazing amazing uh, journey so when you talk about the nih i assume you're talking about the nih from the perspective of the united kingdom is that correct? Uh, so, would you what do you mean by the NIH? I, 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 I maybe I heard you wrong when you were NHS talking. NHS I was Deborah. curious. Of, it's it's what? NHS National it? Health Service. Oh yes, right. the NHS. Yes. 
sorry, I heard American, you know, I, I, everything's, <laughs> uh, I thought, I thought I heard that wrong. So um, only because I would think the NIH, the National Institute of Health in the United States would be very, very intrigued by this as well. So I was just curious about the funding only because this is very powerful. So um, we can, uh, you can also answer some of that offline, but I, I was just curious, you know, about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I've been, I'm in early conversations with, uh, yeah, a partnership, um, yeah, partnership trust down here. And so we're just sort of in the early conversations of applying for funding, um, yeah, applying for funding and making sure that we have the right people in place to do it together. But I think, you know, the strength of this will only be in the partnerships that build it from the ground up. And so I'm really keen to make sure that we have voices from sort of academic research and healthcare as well as, you know, people with lived experience. So, uh, yeah, still applying for more funding and hopefully that will happen this year. We'll keep all of our fingers crossed oh, for you. Can. Get, in, get in touch if you want to help us make it happen. Yes, absolutely. So we're um, really, I'm as a eternal child, the the lack of inhibition that you get when you're playing in all of this stuff is, is um, you know, is something that I think is really intriguing. You know, the, the fact that you're able to take people back to their childhood experience, take them to a place where that lack of inhibition enables them to express themselves in a way that's helpful is, is, is really, really um, quite exciting because you're right, most of the time we're we're very inhibited when we're talking about ourselves, about our health, about our experience, particularly about our mental health. So thank you so much for you know taking us down this angle and on this journey. And I know it's at an early stage in the journey, but it's been fascinating chatting with you today, Sarah. Uh, we need to thank our supporters, Barclays and My Clear, My Clear Text for um, helping keep the lights on, helping uh, keep us accessible and everything else. So um, we really look forward to you joining us on Twitter. And I think it's going to be a fascinating Twitter chat. Oh, thank you so before much. Before we go, yeah, before we go, can you, I, I, I'm so sorry to be rude, but will you make sure that we have this on video? Is there a website? Is there some way people can contact you? We'll also put it on access chat and, but um, just so we can capture it on the video. Is there yeah, a way people sure. can? Of course. So, uh, so my website is hatsumivr.com. So that's H-A-T-S-U-M-I-V-R.com. Uh, you can reach me via Twitter as well. It's at Sarah Tico or at hatsumivr. Uh, and my email's on the website as well. Thank you. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Oh, go on. No, no, no. Go for it. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Cool. Have a good day.